G'day guys, Joel Siege, Principal Advisor. Chris Arnold, Tax Professional. Martin Bennett, Mortgage Broker. Loan Room. We've got a special guest today, Marty, as you heard. Uh, looking forward to having him on and uh, stay around for the uh, the podcast. It's going to be great. There's heaps of awesome tips that he gives us today. Um, we'll be covering off all things uh, lending, uh, investment loans, property sort of stuff. Um, so all those tidbits that are fantastic to know and, and, and improve all our uh, listeners' knowledge out there. That's it. And Rifkin's back. We've got a few good Q&As and we've got a good 50-50. Can't wait, guys. Enjoy. Hang around. All right, g'day all, welcome back. Uh, thanks for tuning in again. It's good to have you guys back with us uh, again for episode 12. Yeah, um, episode 12, mate. Yep. Yeah, yeah, Joel Seach here. We've got Arnie with us and we've got our special guest, Marty. Say day, Marty. How are you guys? Great to be here. From the Lone Room in Doncaster East. Yes, yeah. that's spot on. So great to have you, mate. So just doing the recording on a uh, on a Tuesday, special event recording with a special guest. So good to... Um, Good to get stuck into a few things or all things uh, loans today with Marty. But um, before we lay into it, let's uh, give a bit of a news update, Arnie. And probably before the news update, D's 7 and 0. 7 and 0. Lids, lids off even further. I thought the Kangas were going to do for us, actually, because I, was, I don't know if you saw the stats in the first half, but they were winning in every category. So it was good that we came back and got the win. Uh, you know, a few injuries, though. Tomo that got a, brought a bit of a tear to my eye. One of our key defenders went down with a. ACL, so... By the time this podcast gets released, uh, we play Sydney on Saturday nights, so we might... Uh, it might be 8-0. <laughs> might be 8-0, but we might, we might be 7-1 and one as well. So, uh, anyway, we'll see how we go, but... Uh, well, Martin's just informed me he's an Essendon man, but not too wedded to them, so by the end of this podcast, might try and recruit him over the, Yeah, come to the D's, mate. See how we go. See how we go. <laughs> um, news update. News update. So, I just want to touch on um, the Berkshire Hathaway earnings call. Um, so, and I'll just hit the highlights. So I'll just try and keep it brief because it was a five hour, uh, you know, call, but there's a lot to go through. So and Berkshire Hathaway, for those that don't know, is uh, Warren Buffett's company. So one of the and best, one of the best uh, investors in the world, the best investing duo the world's ever seen. So, um, they, one tidbit, which Warren sort of touched on, which was interesting was that if you looked at the top, uh, companies by market cap in 1989, um, and compared them to the top market cap companies today, then none from 1989 are still in the top 20. And he was asking about what's going to happen, you know, years out. And he was saying that he thinks China will become more dominant in that space, but still thinks the US will hold its own. He said that in regards to Berkshire selling the airlines, they actually had to sell because if they didn't, the airlines wouldn't have been eligible for government bailouts. So that was an interesting little thing that came out of that mm. uh, call. Charlie Munger thinks that Berkshire will outperform the S&P 500. Uh, and Warren has famously said that he thinks everyone should just get involved in the S&P 500. Um, tech stock valuations with 0% interest rates, they still think they're cheap, even though people are saying the market's overvalued. And SPACs are the reason that Berkshire has not been able to get any mergers and acquisitions get, uh, done in the last year because SPACs and private equity just keep eating them up. So, oh, What's well, SPACs for those that don't know? Special purpose acquisition company. So it's just a different way of taking a company public. Basically, you get a shell company. They call it a blank check company because you get this shell company with money and then they go out, to, sorry, money, uh, they go out to a private company and say, we've got $2 billion. We want to buy a part of your business or all of your business and we'll take you public that way rather than a direct listing or, a, or an initial public offering. Mm. And the last thing from the call was um, Apple was a mistake to sell. So it was Warren Buffett's call. He sold 10% of their Apple stake, I think it was, and Mungo was not happy with him. So that's the news from the Berkshire Hathaway earnings call anyway. I love oh. that. So Buffett actually admitted it was a mistake, did he, in terms of that? I love that, how you can, as an investor, you can self-reflect and say, got that one wrong, uh, sort of, proves, I think, uh, authenticity of, of the person, so. Yeah, he was saying it was definitely a mistake. He said that because Berkshire's doing buybacks, they're still increasing the, the net holdings for their shareholders anyway. But yeah, you know, hindsight's 2020. And that um, uh, mention of the, the top companies in 1989, they're not in the top um, companies now, is that, is that correct how you mentioned that then? The top 20 is completely different. Yeah. And they were sort of postulating, if you look another 30 years out, Yeah. What will be the top 20 then yeah so i think in 1989 the top company i forget which one it was it was like owned by japan might have been like a, a sovereign company it was the top companies in the world is it in the world okay. and, and that one had 100 billion market cap and the top company in the world today is apple yep. two trillion market cap so. so so they don't think that apple will be in the top 20 in the next well but buffett says he thinks they'll still be there with well, historic if historically anything has to do with it yep. historically saying it, it, it may not 
But, yeah. you know, it'd be a big bet to say they wouldn't be. Yeah. Um, was massive. A really cool book I actually read, which I don't think I mentioned on um, the podcast or sorry, the live stream with Marty. If you haven't seen the live stream, it's on uh, The Lone Room or your profile, Marty Bennett. Yeah, and that's um, up at The Lone Room as well, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So check that out. But I mentioned, I mentioned some of the books I've read. Good to Great is a really cool book. I don't think I mentioned on your podcast, but it talks about the best companies in the 50s and how that transitioned through the 80s and 90s when they did this book and this research. And it's, it was incredibly uh, interesting to see um, how they um, uh, reviewed these companies and how people were the key components to from a company being good to a great company. Um, and it spoke about that transition of what the companies were then. Um, it, it changed. The biggest companies were, were no longer the biggest companies. So um, mm. what you mentioned there just sort of yeah um, triggered a little um, ringer in my, my head there about that. Good recommendation. And maybe this is a good segue because before we do get into interviewing Marty about, you know, all things loans, we were looking for a few book recommendations from Marty about like what your 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 key books are for the tankers, Marty. Definitely. I'll, I'll probably got like a two, three books on the go at the moment. One is we actually do a book club within our team. So everyone's currently reading How to Influence and Influence People. Oh. Um, I'm reading right now as well which I started again last night for the second time is Blue Ocean Strategy mm -hmm. have you heard of Blue Ocean Strategy no, no. this has got to be one of the best business books you can read I mean if, if you, you can relate to any sort of field that you want to be in they talks about if you've got the masses the masses operate in a place called the Red Ocean where all the sharks are where everyone's there Blue Ocean is how do you find that Blue Ocean where no one's swimming no one's out there because it's so far out at sea and you find your niche in your marketplace out in the blue ocean. So it's a blue ocean strategy. Clear water. Spot on. It's a yeah. phenomenal book. Yeah. Um, and I'm also reading it three on the go, Relentless. Relentless. Again, well, for the fifth time. Yeah. So blue ocean strategy, that appeals to me. I'm going to look into that one. They all sound good, but yeah. blue ocean strategy, it's, I oh know I'm coming back to Berkshire again, but that yes. sort of sounds similar to like their investing philosophy, which is look where no one is. Yeah. Yep. It sounds simple, but you know, yeah, barriers, yeah. barriers to entry, and yeah, Ray Dalio, um, his book Principles, another phenomenal book. That's amazing. I've read that yeah. one, and yeah, that's like his principles to life, basically, and how he goes about it. That's that's really good. And uh, for the tankers, you can go to Ray Dalio's LinkedIn and watch a video, which is like a summary of that. Also very good if you can't be bothered to reading book. the whole book. I'll check it out. I'll check it out. It's a big <laughs> yeah. book. Put the uh, link up for me, Arnie, so I can check it out. All right, I will. I've been uh, lazy. And 50-50, we had the question the other week. Um, Marty, was uh, soft, um, a soft cover book or hard cover book? What do you prefer and why? Ooh, so soft or hard cover? Prefer hard cover. Probably hard cover. Yeah? Yeah, probably a few reasons. I've got three young kids. You can need to tap them on the backside, it's easier. <laughs> um, feels strong and sturdy. Yep, yep. Yep. Yeah, it looks good in the bookshelf. It looks really good in the bookshelf. It looks, makes it look smarter because in the bookshelf it sort of keeps them all up and makes it look like you've got more books than you do. And do you uh, manage to do a lot of reading or is it more audio books for you or a mixture of both? I'm a mixture of both. I go through phases with reading. Yeah. So right now I'm probably reading a good hour a day yeah. plus audio. Yeah. So if it's a book, say like um, Blue Ocean Strategy, I'll read it because I like to highlight it and I look at it as a study book. Yeah. Something like Relentless which is more of a mindset book, I'll do that by audio. Yeah, cool. Great. Love it. I love that. Good recommendations for the tankers. So we might just... Speaking of uh, speaking of books. Oh, yeah. Bring it back. Yeah. So we uh, speaking of books, good little segue there into uh, Rivkin's <laughs> rules. We we gave Rivkin a, a breather last week um, just because... Uh, because uh, this week with a, uh, with a uh, I guess, a bit of a caveat to say, uh, Rivkin's history, we don't know a whole heap about. We know there were some issues with some insider trading and whatnot. So we're by no means um, um, promoting that by any way, but we just enjoy the book and we like having a bit of a, uh, a laugh at whatever comment comes up in the book. So let's uh, let's bring it back uh, much to uh, one of our listeners, Sammy's um, appreciation, I'm sure, because you mentioned it was one of his favorite segments or was, was his favorite segment. So let's uh, open the book up, see what page we land on here. Oh, so it's the front, the cover to this chapter is actually called Rivkin's Favorite Rivkinisms. So let's, <laughs> let's open up the first page. Okay, so it's got a picture of him and his um, him and his cars. So there's uh, there's classic cars in front of, and it's saying it says at the bottom, "If you like it, buy it." And then on the right hand side, <laughs> what a philosophy. it's got people often ask Rene if if his logical, fundamentally based bargain hunting investment style will ever ever become ineffective because too many people will practice it. 
His response is that he has not seen a trend developing towards common sense, discipline and patience in the markets. So there you go. And another one, two for one today. There is nothing quite like a good laugh. I'm glad it comes so easily to me. There you go. What do you reckon about that? If you like it, buy it. My wife would love that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a... Uh... That, that second one about, you know, uh, not seeing rational, I, I, I'm paraphrasing, I've already forgotten what you said, Joe, but not seeing people be rational in the market, that's so true, so. Yeah. Well, they say common sense is never common. Yeah, actual pearl of wisdom from Rifkin. There you Brilliant. go. Yeah, <laughs> so sort of related to investments today. We brought it back, I love brought it. Brought it back, brought it back. So um, let's dive in and start interviewing Marty, what we're here for, what the tankers want to hear. So, Marty. Yes. Uh, the loan room. Yes. How did you get started in this field? Did you like, and, and maybe talk us through at a high level, like the steps that took you to where you are today. Definitely. So um, I'm an entrepreneur at heart, never had a job. Um, I was actually putting some real estate deals together. I had a broker myself and he was talking to me about the industry, um, sparked my interest. At that time, I think I had an entertainment business and a hairdressing salon. Um, not that I was a hairdresser. So it really sparked my interest, what he was doing for me. And I love people. And I saw the service part of it to really help and support people. Um, so that really sparked my interest. I then found someone to go into to, who could help mentor me. Mm -hmm. um, Vince Ballier from Choice Home Loans back in the day. Once I'd spent a few years under his belt and I got to understand the industry, I left to go straight on my own. Probably too soon if I'm honest with you because mm -hmm. I needed a bit more guidance and mentorship. Um, and then it was when I got married going back 10 years ago that we really said, let's focus this is the industry we love. We, people is everything to me. It's We love serving and helping people in this field. Let's launch out and create what is now The Loan Room. That's awesome. So The Loan Room, just for those that don't know, mortgage broker or more than a mortgage broker? So we're, we're mortgage brokers. So we're a team. There's nine of us in the office at the moment. Um, we are essentially mortgage brokers, specialize in refinancing, first home buyers, second home buyers, and small developers. Hmm. Oh, that's awesome, man. So, and just for my own um, personal reference, when you went out and first started this, were you still working those other businesses or did you just drop it all and then start? So, so my initial journey, um, and I was actually interviewed this morning, I would say I'm a late bloomer, um, which is not a bad thing. No. But I think when you have a little drive, you get to the destination either way. I start, When I first started out, I was doing a, a lot of different things and mortgage broking was ha happened to be one of them. So it wasn't till, and you know, they say behind every great man is a great woman. Yeah. Well, it wasn't until I met my wife, we really got married and said, let's scrap everything we're doing. Let's focus on one thing, which I think is really important and become true specialists in what we do. I love that. And so does your wife work in the business today? Yeah, she's, she's just coming back. So we've got three young children and she's been say CEO of the household. Wow. Um, but she helped me initiate and actually grow the company to start with when we had children she stepped away to focus on the family and now she's coming back in as an operations role to really help um i suppose see things and and we're really good at yin and yang so we're on great she's not so much mm -hmm. but she's fantastic and we really balance each other out that's what you need mate you need a bit of balance that's perfect yeah awesome and yeah. i guess on, on top of that so just chatting about um, your uh, business set up and, and the loan room itself and uh, you know how you're a people person and I know from our uh, catch up on our Facebook live event um, you, you spoke about and we spoke about prior to that how you service and how you look after um, people or clients of yours yep. um, that have previous clients and do your yearly anniversary so yes. tell us about that and then I felt that was really special and something different you, that you offer um, uh, to differentiate yourself. So tell us about when people look at brokers, what, what, what's a good broker? What should they be looking at? What should they be looking for? And how to, you know, what questions to ask, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, in today's environment, I don't know why anyone would go to the bank, to be really honest. They should be dealing with a broker purely of choice and level of expertise. A good broker, ideally today, they, they need to have a team behind them because, for instance, there's delays, um, being a, a customer-based business, you need to have amazing communication. So a good broker, whether it's the loan room or somebody else, they should have a great support team because a broker is generally so busy pack, packaging up deals, looking for the best deal is what their job really is. The back-end processing of that needs to be taken care of somebody else. Mm. So if you're looking for a broker, make sure they have a great team behind them because this is a, a so-called team business that someone should be working with. Mm. 
Um, what you mentioned then too, Joel, was the one settlement's taken place. At the long run, we really believe that's almost when the relationship starts. So if the relationship starts from there, it's what happens and what systems and processes do you have in place to be able to service your clients. One, so as a business perspective, they're clients for life. Um, so we, we're often, it's probably a weekly occurrence doing a, like a $15,000 top up for clients. Mm. Now that's purely there to serve because that's no financial benefit to the business. From a customer's perspective, we have somebody in house now who manages those clients and certain touch points throughout the year mm -hmm. forever to make sure every year they're getting an annual review. So we'll call up a client, say, Joel, hey, Joel, congratulations. Just wanted to let you know, we've just done a pricing request with your current bank and we've managed to get you another quarter of a percent off. Mm -hmm. To us now moving forward and where we're going, it's all about we want to be already thinking what the customer's thinking mm -hmm. and have almost preempted what they want us to do. Mm. I love that. And I've got to say, like, not that I'm trying to pump up your tires, Marty, but I wholeheartedly agree no one should be using a bank because I feel like in my own experience using a mortgage broker, shout out Rossi, that um, it just takes all the stress out of it for the people who are trying Spot to on. get the loan, right? Mm -hmm. And like you guys are professionals. Yep. You've got all the relationships there in place. And just, I'm sort of going off here a little bit. I'm in a rabbit hole here, but those relationships, how important is that for your team to maintain the relationships with the people who are going to be, you know, lending the cash? Like, how do you manage uh, that? It's everything. So you're talking about from a, a, a broker client perspective? Yeah. So we maybe do things a little bit different. We believe the relationship is with the company. Mm. So we set up and we run our business in three, so there's three different stages for a client. There's the initial consultation and strategy session, which done gets done with a broker. Mm -hmm. So that relationship and understanding from a, a broker client is so vital to make sure the structure's there. Structure is more important than rate, right? Um, because that can either save them, you're in the ATO, right? Yep. So it either, if you don't get it structured right from day one, good luck trying to restructure it in the future for tax purposes. Yep. Um, that then from there though, we then have a, a client relationship manager that once the loan's actually been submitted to the lender, mm -hmm. they will then manage and serve that client because Clients need, a lot of clients need handholding or just even reassurance that everything's going well. They need to be know that they can call an office. There's always someone there who understands what they're trying to do and they can step through. This is where it's currently at. Hmm. So when you look at a home loan, it's not just about lodging a loan. It's about the deal structure, the client relationship and service through to approval. And then the next most important part is settlement. Yeah. So if someone's buying a house, they need to understand that settlement is didn't taken care of. So we actually have a dedicated person whose full-time role is just to ensure settlement is set up, settlement is done right on time and money is where it's meant to be. Yeah, and I think um, some really, really great points and you can tell the overlay of service and that theme around looking after the client and the customer, both initially but then ongoing. When you spoke about how you do those reviews of those service calls, those annual reviews and whatnot, um, and I think in, in, in our profession, we do annual reviews as well, um, but one of those key things you mentioned was going to bat for the client to get a, a rate discount or a competitive well. discount. I think, you know, a lot of the time as, as clients or people in general, we get busy in life and busy doing things. So to have someone behind the scenes that will go into bat and do that for you is fantastic because to the listeners out there, um, I, I may be telling you something you already know, but you may not know is the banks or the big lenders don't really care about Correct. giving you the best discounted rate. Um, they're not going to call you up and say, hey, congratulations, we've been able to rip off um, 20 basis points of yeah. your loan. You actually have to do that. You have to make that call. You have to almost make that threat to say you're going to leave if they don't come to the party. Now, it put someone in finance, I tend to do that for myself anyway, regularly, but to have someone behind the scenes because life gets in the way, you get busy, to have someone that's actually proactively doing that for you is a fantastic thing um, that I think will, you know, it obviously adds value straight away and it's bottom line value impactful too. So it, it, it's vital. A bank's, a bank's business model is new customers, not existing customers. Mm. Yeah. It's exactly. how do we bring in new customers? Also, from our client's perspective, it's refinancing isn't always the solution. We actually did, did a video not long ago. It's why you should not refinance. Yeah, yeah. Because if you don't refinance correctly, it can cost you well over 100 grand. Mm -hmm. Because if someone's been paying their mortgage for five years and they listen to, say, I won't mention anyone on the radio, and they say, hey, you're paying 10 bucks a month too much to go refinance. If you walk into the bank, they give you a 30 year loan term. So if you don't understand what you've just done, those five years, call it $100,000 of interest, 
he's just gone down the drain. Yeah, mm. that's spot on. And just circling back to what Joel was saying as well, Marty, you and your team at the loan room would have those existing relationships with the banks, Correct. so you would know who to call and how spot much on. to push to get the best possible discount spot for your on. clients. Yeah. Yeah. Next spot question, Armdog. Yeah, well, the next one goes down to a bit of a, well, sort of similar, is variable or fixed interest rates in the modern environment. What are the pros and cons of each of those for your customers? Uh, great question. Um, if you're looking at a long-term investment right now, you probably fix it. Yep. Um, if you're an owner occupied, you potentially look at a split. That split, I want to talk about structure again, mm -hmm. needs to be based on those on the individual. So let's pretend you've got someone with a, a really high disposable income mm -hmm. and their goal is to be able to pay the mortgage off faster. Well, having a, a fully fixed interest rate actually just hinders that. Um, if someone's goal is to pay down the loan, you want to look at, well, let's actually set a goal around that. Say they can pay off $100,000 in two years and they're borrowing 500 grand. You might look at a $400,000 fixed rate because the rate's gonna be lower and $100,000 variable. It also gives them a tangible target to see, hey, we wanna get rid of this 100 grand. We focused on 100 grand and set up a variable loan for that specific purpose. Mm -hmm. So I think fixed rates right now are amazing. Mm -hmm. um, what you can pay 1.79%. You just got to have a strategy and a, a reason because there's no cookie cutter approach. Every client is very, very different. So it's, I can't stress that. It's so vital to go in. If you're getting a fixed rate and a variable, don't just let someone say, hey, go 50-50. Yeah. Have a reason behind what you're doing. Yeah, and great example. Love the examples on here for easy to understand for our listeners out there. They can listen to the car and say, okay, that makes sense. Great example of the 100K and the 400K for a $500,000 loan. Tangible example over a two-year period. For listeners that don't know, What's the reason that uh, if someone's trying to repay their loan faster, yeah. they shouldn't have it all fixed? Very good question. So a fixed rate is is fixed and it has limitations. So there's penalties with majority of fixed rates if you pay over a certain amount off that loan within that two-year period or three-year period or whatever the fixed rate period is. Yeah. That's, is, that's the, is that the only con for fixed? Or genuine question. Are there any other cons for a fixed Um if you so let's say someone wants to flip a property, yeah. you don't fix it because yeah. if you break a fixed rate, there's penalties. There are a couple of banks out there now that will offer a hundred percent home loan, sorry, hundred percent offset accounts with a fixed rate. Oh really? Yes. Can we name them? Who who's that? Um, if you name them, go to theloanroom.com.au. The It's Bank Australia. Okay. It was a phenomenal bank. Teachers Mutual Bank, Firefighters Mutual Bank. Those lenders have a real niche and they'll give you a 100% offset account. And the other one, uh, interestingly, which we, we haven't mentioned because we're in a different environment, but the big uh, one in the closet is fixing when it's, the rates are higher. That's the big worry you've got as well. Yes. In probably previous years, more relevant, which we didn't actually mention then, is if you were five, six years ago and fixing at 5%, 6%, and you're fixed for a long term. Yeah. Uh, probably, you know, five years is the max now, I think, with fixes anyway. Can you do 10? Oh, I think you can do, you're crazy to do 10, but you yeah. can do 10. Yeah, so if you're sort of stuck at something high and the rates come down, 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 and you're stuck at something yeah. high, that's that risk you take as well. But we're in a very low environment at the moment. I, so. I always say banks are, are probably a bit smarter than, yeah. than myself. <laughs> so if you follow the fixed rates, it's often a good, um, I suppose you can perceive where the bank believes rates are going to go to. Yeah. So right now, longer term fixed rates are going up. Yeah, mm. yeah great example. Absolutely. Yep. Cool. Yeah, I think actually I've like just going back to that. I've actually noticed that in the last couple of years, I've had a few friends who have done that, who have fixed it like not the wrong time, but yeah. like you know, yeah, it's just a touch higher than they could probably get. You know? yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so sometimes I just want to touch on one point. So sometimes it's for an emotional reason too. You'd fix it. Young couple are about to have their first child. Yeah. Don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. It's not even about saving money. It's about peace of mind. Yeah, the certainty. Yeah, yeah. Spot security, on peace of mind. Spot on. Yeah, great. Um, next one is just in terms of equity and and. For I guess uh, listeners out there that might uh, you know have a bit of equity in a property they have a principal place of residence for example, um, and whether they be upgrading to a, a new principal place possibly in the current market there's a lot of yep. people upgrading a lot of first home buyers but a lot of people upgrading as well to bigger homes with families mentioning families, um, or you know for a uh, for an investment loan in terms of uh, using your equity um, to buy that first investment property for example so how. How does that work? How do people use equity? How does it sort of come into play when you, you know, if, if you own a principal place of yeah. residence and you're buying something? So let's look at if you go, if you own a principal place of residence, I mean, I think most people would have equity in the home if they bought it in the last three or four years. Um, to use that to either invest say, in the share market um, and or start to build a real estate portfolio, 
what a lot of people for some reason actually understand when you use equity you, you basically it's debt right so i'm going to give a i try to paint a picture again if someone owns a home let's just say it's worth one million dollars mm -hmm. they have a four hundred thousand dollar loan against that that's for their principal place of residence so it's obviously non-tax deductible debt they want to turn around and buy a five hundred thousand dollar investment there's two ways that the bank would use that equity one is what's called cross securitization which we don't believe in at all because it gives too much control to the bank. Um, but just to give you an example, if the property purchases $500,000 with costs, 525. If you've got that much equity in your home, the bank would actually turn around and give you a loan of 525, taking your principal place of residence as security as well. However, in that example, if something goes wrong, you can't actually sell that investment property because you actually owe more than what it's worth. The better example to do that and how to use the equity would be to set up one facility against your principal place of residence as a second split from your home loan. So you'd have a $400,000 home loan and maybe a $125,000 um, equity portion, which would be used for the investment loan. 20% deposit and closing costs. Hmm. By doing it that way, you can either go to another bank or even if it's the same institution and borrow 80% against that investment property now the, the loans aren't what's called cross secured where they take both securities for the one loan. Mm. The reason why I love that and I think it's so important is one, from a tax purpose, you can still clearly identify what loans is tax deductible. But I always like to base things on a worst case scenario. So if you ever need to sell that property and you're going to take a loss, you actually only owe 80% on it. So you'd owe $400,000, which if you need to take a hit, you can offload that property without it affecting your principal place of residence. Yeah, mm. great tip. And in a, in a real life example, let's say that principal place of residence loan is with CBA. Yep. Um, you take a, a separate loan or, or a separate um, equity unlock out of that as a 125K. -er. Yep, that'll be with CBA. Yeah, with then. CBA. Yep. yep, so that'd be classed as an investment loan for tax purposes without yep. giving tax advice. Always general in nature yes, on this of podcast. Course, always of general in nature, never personal advice. Always seek personal, professional, financial advice or taxation advice whenever you're uh, looking at your own situation. But 125K as a, as an, as a loan, which would uh, be a, an investment loan um, per se, and then a $400,000 loan with say, a, um, oh, pick, a, pick a bank. Macquarie bank, bank. Macquarie Bank. Macquarie Bank, 400K investment loan with yes. Macquarie Bank, which would then secure the property in, uh, let's say it's a property in regional Australia, Bendigo. Yep. Um, and then your own principal place of residence is still standalone with, a, uh, with CBA. CBA and you've got a, just a separate facility yep. there of the 125, yep. Right. For more sophisticated investors, it gets to the point where different banks will lend significantly different amounts of money. Yep. So as someone really grows their portfolio, that type of structure becomes more yep. and more um, important. Yep. Mm. yep. So it keeps you a bit more um, uh, flexible in yes. moving forward. Yep. Yep. That's super interesting. Yeah. Especially in the modern environment, it's really, you know, it's quite hard if you're just sticking with one lender. Um, Correct. Yeah. You know, could potentially cap you, out, cap you out over it. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Anecdotally, what are the best lenders that aren't the big four? In your experience? Oh, Macquarie Bank, hands down, number yeah. one. Okay. Like, yeah. ING, phenomenal. Mm. Um, How are ING to deal with, like, from the loan uh, from the loan room's perspective? Because they've got no... Well, like, they're Dutch. Yeah. So, I'm a Dutchman there. I'm oh, you love them. phenomenal to deal with. <laughs> uh, on, on, a, on, a, on a serious note, ING is probably one of the easiest banks to deal with. Okay. They have probably some of the best products in the market. I think they can settle quick, too. They can settle quick. Um... They, they have their downside. They're probably the hardest bank to get a loan through from a serviceability perspective. Um, but if you look at a bank from a, if you want a bank that has stability in itself, in its core, if it's harder to get funding from them because of the way they assess a client, it's actually a good thing in the long run. Yeah, and quality bank. Yeah. Here's a question for you just off the cuff uh, in terms of, I just mentioned, quick to settle. When people are buying properties now, Ooh. things are taking... <laughs> Can be taking a while, I've heard, to settle. What do you think is a minimum settlement date for someone to say, I'm purchasing this property with this settlement date? Okay, so if it's a normal purchase, 60 days. Right? We're, we're working with banks and I mean, some of our, you know, I say go to a broker, we have issues too, like everyone else, right? Yeah. So sometimes we've we got to communicate with our clients that get frustrated because it takes so long. We've got banks that take 45 days to look at a deal. Yeah. Mm. Then if 45 days, now they say, well, your pay slips are out of date, you gotta go back and provide them. Now it takes another two weeks for them to look at it. So if you're gonna buy a property now and you know you want to do a fast settlement, you can't be picky with your lender. You gotta to go to a lender that's gonna meet your requirements to settle. So you throw in Macquarie Bank again, right now, two day turnaround. Really? That's right. Fast. I've actually just done a loan myself with a bank called Bluestone. Amazing. 
Um, non is a non-major. They're probably one of the best banks around. One day. Wow. You go to a major right now, It's you just don't want to do a 30-day settlement. Yeah. Like you need 60 days minimum. Yeah. With all the modern technology, it's crazy how it's actually slower than it was probably, what, 15, 20 years ago for turning around. It, it, it's, it's, uh, here's an interesting thing. I, I'm not going to mention the group. They're probably one of the, the, the biggest broker groups in Victoria. Um, phenomenal operators. They have clout. So let's throw, I'm not going to throw any bank under the bus. There's a particular bank right now. If you want to leave them, it's over 36 days for them to action a discharge. Wow. This particular brokerage, and this is like kudos to them, one day. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So when friends? banks say, no, we can't physically do A, B, and C, they clearly can. Yeah. It's just, who are you as a human being to them? Yeah, gotcha. Do you have clout with them or you don't? Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. You just triggered a question I wanted to ask then. Um, from the loan room's perspective, right? Like I sort of see it a bit of a, like a... What's the word? A bit of friction there, right? Because obviously the people who are selling probably want the shortest settlement dates. But people no. who are buying, is it the other way around? No, not at all. It, it's it's different for everyone. Yeah. So okay. let's say you've got someone, and this happens quite a bit. You might have someone who's downsizing, going to go to an old people's home. Well, it's based on their terms of when they need to do it. Right now, actually, more than ever, I've seen people with really long settlements requested by the vendor because they haven't found a property to move into yet. Okay. Are you still seeing a lot of auctions with 30, 45, and 60s, or are they now more like 45, 60? Uh, more 60, 90s. 60, 90s. A lot of 120s at the moment, yeah, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that coincides with what we're talking about Correct. with longer settlements. And yeah. yeah, everyone's different, you know, because someone could buy a place and they want to sort of sell their place in between. So they might sell, they might buy first on a longer settlement, a 120, yeah. and they might try to sell with a 90 or a... Or a you know. There's a lot of licensee agreements going on as well, which it, it, that means you basically rent it back. Mm -hmm. Um, that I haven't seen before. Yeah, yeah. It's purely because, so when someone's making an offer, it's not always about money. And right now, more than ever, if someone will take, let's say there's, you and I are bidding on the same property, Joel. You offer 20 grand more than I do, but I come in unconditional. Yeah. They'll take my offer nine yep. times out of 10 over the price. Because yep. they know, well, geez, you might not know for six weeks. Yep. Then if you get, then if you call off on that period, yep. they're going to remarket the property. Yeah. So if you're looking to buy, it's often got more to do with terms. Yep. Can you meet the vendor's terms for settlement? Yep. And also, if you can go in unconditional, it's... it's and the lease back thing I think you mentioned is if you buy a property and there's someone in there at the moment and they they haven't quite gotten ready to where they want to get to, they can lease, they can offer to lease it back from the Correct. purchaser. Yep. Yeah, yep, yep, just for the listeners that didn't know that. I think that's a pretty good cover off. We've got a Q&A question, but before we get to it, because it's actually like I say, we've got, a Q we've got a couple of Q&As, but one that specifically we can ask Marty, do you want to ask Marty anything else regarding this process? Marty? Yeah, before we get to the Q&A section, anything else we didn't ask you, Marty? Anything else that oh, we, the, 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 the viewers need to know, the listeners need to know? Anything else that uh, we should, you know, cover off? That they need to be aware of. Mm. You know what? It's really simple. Don't use Afterpay. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's the biggest... Yeah. I want to go into it because banks look horribly... At people who use Afterpay. Like ruins your credit, you mean? It ruins your credit. Yeah. yeah. One, you just shouldn't use it in general, right? Yeah. Is that we've spoken about that before. I'm glad that you said that because it backs up what Joe and I said in a previous yeah. podcast about the dangers of using yeah. services like Zip they're, and they're, Afterpay. They're right. If you're going to use a credit card, pay it off every month. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing that people do not understand, understand your own living costs. Mm -hmm. Banks dive into it. Some banks really go into it. Um, we obviously ask everyone what their living costs are. Most people under quotes like you wouldn't believe because they actually have no idea what they spend. Yep. So especially if you're a first home buyer, to me, it's all about habit, right? Most people, if they live in a home with mum and dad, they're going to buy their first home. They can afford it. They're not in the habit of putting the money aside. So if you want to understand what you really spend and be honest, if you like to spend money, say you like to spend money mm. and put it down. Nothing wrong with that, right? It's about, I think, understanding where you really are. The bank will find out You'd be miserable because they would decline you. So understand, take stock. Yep. Yeah, we always speak about that proactive planning, proactive allocation of money, uh, being aware of it, um, mm -hmm. ensuring that you're on top of it. And things like afterpay become out of control yeah. because they're re they're retrospective. You, you you pay the money, it comes out of your account a month later. Really hard to, to proactively track that. So great tips. Yeah. Uber Eats. Is that a myth or is that a... Uber, you go Uber Eats and you just eat it as much as you want. Just make sure you understand you spend it. Yeah, but is, it, is Uber Eats a, a myth in terms of credits? Like looking at no, 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 no. Okay. Uh, what about 
the other myth was if you're making transactions with funny funny names on the transactions to the yes. bank. I wonder if that was a myth or not. You know, oh, you, okay. you transfer to a mate and say um, for yeah. the, I don't know. Something. Yeah. Something, something yes. untoward the night before. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> they, they look at that. But this is the big one. If you if you like to have a punt, ah. keep a lot of that. Like we, have, we see clients who enjoy a punt. Nothing wrong with enjoying a punt. Mm. But understand what it'll look like to a bank. Yeah. If you are a young or whatever age you're going out and they see you take cash or whatever it is out of casinos, yeah. big no-no. Ooh. They don't yeah. like that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, another good thing is get, get your copy of your own credit report. Yep. It's really easy to do. Where, 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 yeah, where would the tankers get their own credit um, report? There's a few places. Oh, what is, I actually just got my own. I haven't applied for a home loan in a long time. I was sweating bullets getting my own credit report. <laughs> yep, yep. I was lucky. It's really good. Um, I think my, mycreditfile.com.au okay yeah. it, it's important to understand that there's been a big shift um, in how banks actually do credit reporting it's gone more to the US style where it's all about positive credit reporting mm -hmm. so so many people have that one bank account and it's always overdrawn by five bucks that goes really negative against you actually getting a home loan mm. because they look at that and you might think to yourself hey this is one bank it's five bucks who cares to the bank they say well if you can't manage this one account how can you possibly manage a mortgage? Gotcha. Yeah. So everything is about positivity and how you positively score towards the banks. It used to just be, we don't care about any of that. Is there any negatives? Yes, no. Okay, that'll affect your loan. I actually think we'll see this place roll out where rates will be based on credit score. Right. And the best way to probably, I mean, this is anecdotal, I might be getting this completely wrong, but would the best way to improve your credit score just be pay things on time pay when you've got time. obligations, yeah, and then it'll organically improve? You do not need a credit card to get a credit score. It's the biggest myth sold by banks that people get into debt. Yep. Yeah. You get a telephone, you got a credit score. Yeah. Great question. Love it. Love it. Um, cool. Thanks for uh, filling us in on the uh, extra things to ask there, Marty. I'm glad I, glad I asked that because that was some gems. Yeah, Thank that was excellent. Yeah, cheers, mate. So um, the first Q&A. Yeah. Right? Marty, we'll, we'll ask this one of you because it directly relates to this, is that for someone who's starting out who maybe um, has help from their parents by yep. way of a gift or a security of the parent's home, uh, how does that work and how do you make it work effectively? It, was a, it was a Q&A from Carl with a K. That's from Carl with a K. Yeah, beauty. Yeah. Carl with a K. Okay, let's use a guarantor. Where, this is where your parents will put up their home as security. The, the reason you would look to do that is to avoid what's called lender's mortgage insurance. Yeah. Lenders mortgage insurance is a fee that typically, if you borrow um, over eighty percent, the bank charges you. Um, and it's not insurance to protect you. No. <laughs> and if you want to go into business, go into a mortgage insurance business because they charge thirty years worth of premiums up front. That's why it's so high. Yeah. So let's let's then look at that scenario of your mum and dad have said, "Hey, great, we're happy to help you out. We want to get you out of the house and into your own place." <laughs> All right. So. For most banks, and I'm going to show you the right way to structure it, for most banks, they'll turn around and say, great, mum and dad, you have plenty of equity. We're happy to take a what's called a limited guarantee over your property. It doesn't have to be with the same bank. So you, the kids can go with one bank and the parents can be with another. When they look at that, they'll then say, let's pretend that this is a 500 grand example again. Kids might have saved 50 grand. So they've got a 10% deposit, assuming no cost to their first home buyer, the bank will then take a limited guarantee of 50 grand against the parent's property. Mm -hmm. Really simple. Most lenders here, you know, we spoke about cross-securing earlier, they'll cross-secure it in the background. The best way to do this, and there's a bank that does it the best, which is CBA for guarantor loans, they'll actually do two completely independent loans. So they'll have one loans just with the actual purchaser at 80% against the purchase price. In this example, then they'll have another loan independent with the guarantors for 50 grand. Right. The reason that's good, again, we want to look at now protecting the guarantors. They're limited to a risk. If there's something happens to the kids, again, if only owe 80% against that home, they can now sell it for less than they bought it for as a worst case. Mm. But also from the borrower's perspective, they know exactly what they need to pay off to release their parents as guarantor. It's 50 grand. 50 grand, yeah. Absolutely. And you can see, you can understand it, you can set goals around it and smash it. Yep, and they can clear that off first if they want to clear the, the cross off. Yeah. And then, yeah, Spot then they'll work on their loan. Yeah. That's how Kate and I got our first home loan. It's, it, mate, we do. I mean, after this podcast, I've got a meeting with a family. And we're doing exactly the same thing. Yeah, and we chat. Yeah, we chat about it with clients quite a lot. You know, when they're looking to help their kids get a, a leg in the property yeah. market, potentially, you can do a gift, a cash gift, but you could also potentially look at that security, uh, um, uh, uh, being going guarantor security. So, yeah, great, great point. And 
Um, there's also things to, to talk around that. We might get a, um, a, a solicitor or a legal expert on down the track in terms of writing up agreements or financial agreements yeah, around that as well, because you know if separations occur or whatnot, you want to be really able to protect important. the downside there. Yeah. So we'll, we'll ensure we get someone on uh, as a specialist. We'll often area. see, um, say the guarantors put caveats over the property if, there's, if they ever have concerns. Yep, yep, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's smart to do. Yeah, it's yeah. smart. Um, and the uh, next uh, question, Arnie, was from who? Jimmy. Jimmy. So Jimmy uh, wrote in uh, regarding uh, NAB equity release, um, which is sort of a version of um, utilizing a loan or a margin loan against a share portfolio. So yeah. are you able to help answer that one? You know a little bit about it? I know a little bit about it. I've never used the product, but it's like I think NAB equity builder. And it's unique in the big four. I don't think the other three offer. I mean, you can get investment loans through any of them. But the thing that makes NAB equity builder unique is that it will take the current portfolio you have as collateral to then, I guess, give you an investment loan. I think it's at 3.75%, wow. but, but you can, is that good or bad in the current environment? Is it okay? Yeah, for a low margin loan, yeah. And I think the minimum, the minimum is $10,000, $10, yeah. um, but you can go up as high as you want. Uh, I think the way that they manage it though, is that you can only invest in index funds, mutual funds, or there may be an option where you're allowed to choose your own, but I like don't quote me on that. So they won't do it against uh, Joel's crypto portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. <laughs> or Marty's crypto. You want Dogecoin, <laughs> Dogecoin, Jolly, or what? What are you in? No, I'm not in any crypto at the moment. But I like was. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah, we'll have to ask Marty about that. We'll have to bring him on for a crypto podcast. Yeah. Do you know a bit about? I know nothing. Oh. <laughs> okay. Me either, Marty. I don't know anything yeah. about it. Now we will get a crypto expert on down the track as well, and uh, I might hit my cousin Adam up if you listen to Adam. I know we spoke. To, I spoke to you a lot about it last Saturday. Saturday night, so I might. I know you're bashful, but I might get you one, mate, or we'll get a crypto expert on. Come team. on, Adam. He loves it. He knows all about it. I want to know about it. And he even sent me a, uh, an app the other day for for regular investing into um, crypto, which he does for his, his kids for schooling down the track. He puts 100 a week in, which is pretty cool. So wow. I'll, uh, I'll divulge that one a bit more uh, down the track. Also, I might even look at it to myself and have a bit of a test run. I'll, so. keep, I'll keep this podcast safe for work, but uh, as, an, as an interesting news item, there was a, a cryptocurrency that has a very questionable name that gained a lot in recent weeks. And um, it's a CR are the initials. So you could probably work it out if you've seen it in the news, but I won't actually mention what it is. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's that's basically an equity builder in yeah. a nutshell. So yeah. And, and margin that. loans are, are used to gear into, you know, like a gear into property. So, sorry, into... this is different to a margin loan though, Jolly. This is a oh. principal and interest loan. Okay, so they're giving you a loan principal interest against your ship. And you can pay it off early. It's completely variable. So they let, so basically, I think people like to use it because of that reason that you can get the, like leverage as if you had a margin loan in a trading account, yep. but you can pay it down like straight away. And then yep. if you're playing with house money, I guess. Do, have, with... do you have a risk of getting called with that one or not? Yeah, yeah. If, yeah, if you get called, they just sell whatever's in the uh, portfolio okay. to yep. cover it. So yep. if you can't pay for whatever yep. reason, I'll say if interest rates rise and you yep. get smashed, yep. they'll sell it. And then uh, there could be the risk of CGT there as well. Yep. Like that's a, that's a capital gains tax event. So yeah, because I think Jimmy mentioned, what's the, do you sort of mention about do you mention pros and cons with margin loans at all, or just or that was a different, uh, yeah? No, well, he no, yeah. I, I left it out specifically, but he was asking about when's the best time to utilize margin in a trading account as opposed to an equity builder. But they're kind of different, so maybe we'll save that yeah. as a second part question yeah. for a later one because it's yeah. not really applicable. Yeah, generally, like as a rule of thumb, as an advisor, you can advise on setting up margin loans, but I don't love doing it for clients because of that reason you just mentioned a few big cons there of forced sell downs or capital gains or calls if you don't have the cash available. Mm. Um, that's sometimes the reason that I find, yeah, if you can just set up an investment that's um, going to be regularly contributed to and added to with your own money and and, and working that way for from, from a share portfolio, I think that's a safer bet and protecting a bit of the downside risk. Um, investment property is a little bit different with gearing because they don't tend to fluctuate as much. Um, and you don't, you know, you don't get called on uh, investment loan, which we've, I think we've spoken about before. Well, no, yeah. very rarely get called on investment loan. You've basically answered the question. I guess the only part we haven't answered, what he wanted to know was when it is appropriate to use margin in trading accounts. And I would say that it's appropriate whenever you want to use it, as long as you are not going overboard. Like you, you touched on all the reasons why it's dangerous or risky to use margin. Mm. I would say only use a small amount of margin and know that you can, it's not going to get on top of you. Know that you can, you know, have cash coming in to yep. cover that. Yep. Um, because it's when people get over leveraged 
get into one of those scenarios you're talking about and find themselves in real trouble. Yeah, pandemic, you know, March, oh, yeah. the portfolio's dropping by 40%. If you, you know, if you got called into that and you didn't have the cash, you're Oof. selling down stocks during that time and they rebound very quickly shortly, shortly thereafter. So People on margin got crushed then, weren't they? For sure, if you didn't have the cash. But um, yeah, so that wraps up the Q&As this week. So keep the Q&As coming in, guys. And the, um, the we love the, the question and answers. And we love all the questions from our viewers. Um, we had another one from Sammy this week, uh, which we'll ask for Roscoe probably or real estate agent when we get them on in the next week or so. Um, we've got a couple of agent friends which we'll bring on in, in terms of how to best work your relationship with real estate agents when you're buying and selling. Um, and Marty, you know, you deal with a lot of agents mm. and whatnot as well. So I think that's a really important topic at the moment with real estate and the way it's going and trying to, you know, best get yourself um, into the market or trying to work with an agent. It, it sometimes can be tricky depending on the agent you're dealing with. Yeah, you know what is, choose, or we deal with agents every day. There's a big difference between one agent and the next, a huge difference. Don't go for the cheapest. Mm. Yep, yep. Yeah, Absolutely. I agree with that. We talk about that as well. Like cheap doesn't always mean good. Yep, exactly. We've got a user submitted 50-50 or what's your choice or either or this week. So I'm pretty keen to ask it of Marty because you know what it is, but Marty doesn't know what it is. So yep. we're coming at him cold. Uh, <laughs> I hope you're a fan. 50-50, Lord of the Rings or Star Wars? Oh, you know, this is bad. I haven't seen any of them. Oh! <laughs> I'm the wrong uh, person uh, to ask. <laughs> do, we, do we have to ask, maybe we have to ask his marketing director, Emma, who's here. Does, yes. Emma, does Emma have any idea on either of those topics? Emma, have you seen either of those trilogies? I would have to say Star Wars because I haven't really seen Lord of the Rings. Okay, uh, I love that. Uh, uh, Star that's... Wars by default for Emma. That's from Mark, by the way. So, Joel, have you ever thought, have you thought on this? Uh, yeah, I've watched Lord of the Rings, but I haven't rewatched it numerous times. So, Star Wars, I've probably watched more. So, yeah, I think Star Wars, and I watched that recent one, which was The Mandalorian, which I enjoyed. But, um, yeah, not a, like, I'm not a crazy Star Wars person. Like, a few people I know are, are full, like, Star Wars fanatics. Um, You're looking at one. I'm a huge, you're a Star Wars I'm a fan. huge Star Wars yeah. fan. I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Recently, shout out Hori and Tommy. They got me onto uh, the Clone Wars, which is on Disney Plus. It's a kid show, but it's the best. And that, <laughs> I absolutely love it. But I'm gonna say I'm, I'm Star Wars all the way on this one, Mark. And when I hear this question, I think of the movie Clerks Two because it's, it's a joke in the plot line where they're saying like Star Wars or or Lord of the Rings, and Randall's like. There's only one trilogy and it's yeah. like, it's Star Wars, man. Like, I don't know, but yeah. And while we're on sci-fi, we, we may as well get the biggest debate that Arnie and I have ever had in movies before. <laughs> and oh, we'll throw this it. one out there. This I'm hoping huge. Marty's seen it. I'm hoping oh, Emma's actually seen, seen it too. Sci -fi movies. You would have so seen these ones, have seen these ones. These okay. are 90s and uh, early 90s and late 80s, I think. I reckon we're disappointing. Ter Terminator 1 and Terminator oh, okay. 2. Terminator 1 and Terminator 2. So before Joel and I get into it, let's see what Marty says. Yeah, let's see what Marty says and then we'll tell our opinion. I remember them, mate, but I've seen them both many times. Yep, yeah, so the first one Arnie's the bad guy, second one Arnie comes back as the good guy. And he's riding the Harley around. Which one do I prefer? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've got to remember them, but if I go back, I'd probably say the second one. Because someone's a villain is the good guy anyway. He's yeah. perceived as the bad guy. He is, yeah. So, yeah. Emma, have you seen him? Yeah, I have. I love the 80s. I would have to go number one. Yeah, oh, yes. You can't beat the original. You can't <laughs> beat the original. Oh, I'm, I'm going to go back and rewatch these now over the next couple of weeks. Yeah. I like number one. Joel? I love number two. Can, no. I, can I explain why I like number one? Yeah, you go, you go, your quick explanation. I'll do my quick explanation and then we'll wrap up. All right, quick explanation of why number one's better. Original is always the best. Number two is the exact same plot rehashed. The only cool part about number two is that it was a plot twist. The Terminator Arnie was a good guy. Like going into it, no one knew. But now that you know, the punch is gone out of that plot twist. So it's just a rehash number one. Number one's awesome. So uh, number two, my reasons, special effects are better. Obviously, that's a hard thing to, 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 to master in the 80s and the 90s, the difference of special effects, but that was awesome. Some of the effects they brought in still probably stand up today. And that plot twist was one of the best plot twists I've ever sort of seen in a movie in terms of having the bad guy that's such a bad villain come back and for the first half an hour of the movie you don't even know yeah. he's a bad guy which is so cool I accept that point but <laughs> and I do love Emma's thought of the 80s you can't beat the 80s the, the tech what do they call the tech noir was that club I listened to a podcast on Terminator 1 and James Cameron actually made that up he, his, his vision around the movie was to call it tech noir which is a mixture of sci-fi and um, I don't know um, action yeah, like, like noir, like the film genre. Yeah, I love yeah, that. I didn't yeah. know that. That's cool. Yeah, that was a club called Tech Noir. So anyway, but um, yeah, Terminator 1, Terminator 2, get back and watch from Marty. And I hear, classic movies. I want to hear succinctly your answer. At the 80s and now. 90s made the best movies, the best music, yeah, yeah. and produced the best basketball. Can't argue with that. Love it. The, oh, the Last Dance, you seen that? Oh, I've seen it four times. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs>
Yeah, uh, right, maybe cool. we should have put more basketball sports questions in for Marty. We might have to uh, bring him back for another podcast and do uh, sports related questions 50 50. Uh, LeBron or MJ? No, that's, yeah. that's not even a question. <laughs> it's not MJ all day. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thanks for uh, coming on today, uh, Marty, and, Mate, and that wraps so up the me. podcast. So tell us, uh, tell the people, tell us where we can find you. I've got Emma sitting here on the side saying, make sure you tell them the social media channels, Marty. Tell yes. us where we can find you. Um, you can find us on socials where the Lone Room. Um, personally, if you want to follow stuff with, with I'm doing, it's the Martin Bennett's. Um, even though we are based in Melbourne, we have clients and we service all over Australia. Um, with Zoom these days, it's really easy. Anyone wants to get in touch, reach out to us through any of those platforms. Um, go to our website, theloneroom.com.au, and yeah, punch your details in. We're there. We're here to help you. Love that, Marty. And ours is at Money in the Tank, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Please drop likes, comments, subscriptions on YouTube, it helps grow the channel. And coming up in the next uh, couple of weeks, we'll aim to get on um, some more special guests because we love doing the guest scenario format. We think it works great. And hopefully you, the listeners, are really enjoying the feedback we get from the last podcast, which was the de developing one. If you haven't gone, check it out with Rossi. Um, this one with Marty, obviously, just that interaction and that conversational style format, which we want to keep uh, enjoyable for people to listen to. So we'll bring on some more special guests. As I mentioned, we'll bring on real estate agents, uh, town planning um, experts, social media experts, Arnie. So we'll bring on a few different people, legal I mentioned as well. So we'll keep that format going, keep um, subject matter experts coming in to um, you know, help hopefully uh, divulge their um, best tips for, for you listeners out there. And uh, Marty's done that today in spades. So thanks heaps, Marty, for yeah, coming cheers, on. Marty. No, thank you, guys. Really great to be here. I want to get, I want to get Marty good. back on for a great debate versus like property developer, real estate agent. We'll get like... Bring, every, bring the whole, every, every guest in. I love it. I love it. Cheers, Marty. All right, thanks, guys. guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks for coming.